Hello and welcome everyone. We're gonna get kicked off with today's presentation. Uh, we're going to talk about the didactic year within the PA program and talking more about the curriculum and te teaching methodologies um, with one of, one of the, um, the different professors from the PA program. And I'm gonna ask that we switch the slide, thank you. Uh, the agenda we're gonna go over is the actual curriculum overview talking about all the different pieces that um, you will need to be able to complete the program and then going into what that didactic year will look like in detail. And then we'll get into a Q&A. And speaking of Q&As, uh, we're going to be using the Q&A chat feature. So if you're looking at the bottom of you're on a desktop or on a laptop, you're gonna look at the bottom or the top of your screen, depending on how your Zoom is configured. It'll have two little chat wit bubbles or widgets, and it'll say the letters Q and A. When that opens up, then you'll see a screen like something like that is on our screen that says welcome. You'll be able to type your questions, submit it, and we'll be able then to be able to see everything that you're asking throughout the presentation. If you are on a mobile device, though, you're going to click to the top left hand of your screen. That'll drop down. It'll say question and answer rather than just the letters Q and A. And then you'll be able to do the same thing. Um, but I'm going to pass it off to Professor Jensen Lewis, who is the program director, and he is like the master of all things didactic. So you are in good hands. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thanks to Sam for always being such a gracious host and hosting these amazing webinars. Uh, as she said, my name is Jensen Lewis. I am the program director here at Case Western Reserve University. Uh, I am the former director of didactic curriculum. So I, uh, previous to my role as program director, oversaw the first 15 months of the program. Uh, and we're really going to highlight that aspect of our curriculum today. So let's talk about our curriculum. Um, we are a 27 month program uh, where students will earn 102 credit hours. <clears throat> that is quite a few hours of credit over a 27 month period. 15 of those 27 months are what we call our didactic phase or in the classroom phase. The other 12 months are the clinical phase. Um, <clears throat> As you can see, we start every May with a new cohort. Uh, so we have a summer one semester, a fall, a spring, and a summer two semester that all comprises our didactic curriculum. Uh, our students graduate in August. Um, and we are very fortunate here at Case Western Reserve University that our students graduate with a Master of Science and PA Studies that's actually conferred through the Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine. Uh, and that is um, sort of unique to our program. We're very fortunate that the degree comes through the School of Medicine. Um, lots of other institutions may have your degree, degree through graduate studies or something like that. But here at Case Western, your PA degree is through the School of Medicine. All right, let's talk about how we teach you in the classroom. Um, we take great pride in the various ways that we teach our students. Uh, you come to school every day, pretty much for 15 months, and every day is going to be totally different. Um, we like to switch it up in the classroom. Uh, the main point here is that we are a generalist program. We are training you to be generalists. That is what the PA profession is founded upon. And so we have highlights truly in primary care and then uh, underserved populations where we have our students working in the community with experiential learning and performing community service. We have a large number of different teaching and learning methodologies which we employ. Um, and I'll highlight just a few here today. Um, we've hosted previous webinars on our experiential learning in the community, but this is where we take what the students are actually learning in the classroom and they're going to apply it directly into the community surrounding us here in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, we really highlight this hugely in the first 15 months of the program. So students are learning how to take a medical history in the classroom, and then they're actually going out and practicing that on patients and community partners in our vicinity. 
We have a tons of clinical simulations and I'll highlight that here shortly on the next slide or two. We have a sim center that is in our building. I'm actually two floors directly above our sim center and we'll highlight the features of our sim center. But our students are in our simulation center at least every week through the first two semesters of our program, which would be summer one and fall one. And then in spring and summer two, various times throughout that curriculum where our students are practicing all of their skills in real life settings, real life scenarios. We have simulations on the angry patient. We have birthing simulations where we'll actually use high fidelity mannequins to actually give birth in an operating room setting. So we are incredibly proud of our Sim Center. We work very closely with the Sim Center here in our building. Um, and we feel that we are second to none in what we can offer from a simulation perspective. We do a lot of case-based learning, problem-based learning. We have an entire problem-based learning curriculum that occurs in our spring semester of the didactic year. And we have lots of cases. Uh, most of our instructors will end every class with a case study where students work in small groups to work through it based off of that lecture topic of the day. We have systems-based learning. So our students are learning all of renal or all of cardiology or all of pulmonology together, typically taught by one or two instructors that are experts within that field. Collaborative and team-based learning. Our students are working in interprofessional teams every Wednesday afternoon of the fall and spring semester of our didactic curriculum, where they're working with MD students, dental students, nursing students, and they're working on community projects. We have a very robust interprofessional education curriculum here at Case that we are very proud of. And finally, we have early clinical exposure. I always joke with the students that when I was in PA school, it took about three or four rotations before I even knew what the heck I was doing in the clinical year. Well, our students get thrown into that situation in about November of their didactic year. And so they have six, seven, eight months of learning the clinical world, learning the clinical realm, getting their feet wet prior to starting full-time clinical rotations in August. And so our students are really ready to go day one of clinical rotations, which really sets them up hugely for success. So they're not kind of trying to figure things out for three to four months. And when that three or four months is gone, then they're left with, you know, nine to eight or nine rotations. So we are very proud of our preclinical exposure, our preclinical experience where our students are out in the community working one half day a week or every other week with local primary care offices to practice their history taking, physical exam skills, their oral presentations and their medical documentation. So as I mentioned, our simulation center is on the second floor of this beautiful health education campus, the uh, uh, the Samson Pavilion, as you can see here in this photo. There are 20 patient exam rooms equipped with all the top equipment. There are three debrief rooms where we can actually hold class and then transition into patient exam rooms for simulations. There are four acute care rooms where we can have uh, mock codes, or we can do um, birthing simulations. We can do um, intensive care unit simulations, um, procedures. This is where all of our clinical procedures are housed as well. We work very, very closely with standardized patients, actors and actresses who come in and they have a script. They are actually patients that our students are seeing. They take medical histories. They do physical exams where we have standardized findings. And then we use, like I said, mannequins and task trainers where our students can learn. Um, and uh, we are very proud of our simulation center. We, um, it is two stories above where our students have class every single day. Um, and uh, we, it is world-class what we can do in our simulation center. Our simulation center staff are 
like I said, second to none, and uh, we're really um, able to do a lot um, that you can't just do when you have lecture all the time. All right, let's dive into the didactic year curriculum in the semesters that we have. So summer semester one, this is going to begin in May. It ends in the very beginning of August. Uh, that's really heavy on anatomy. Uh, so this is human anatomy with a cadaver lab. Our students are dissecting in the cadaver lab. This is really the only course that takes place not in the health education campus. Uh, the cadaver lab is back at the old School of Medicine. Uh, but all of our other courses are taught directly in this building that you can see here on the screen. Uh, you got to know anatomy in order to be a good provider. You got to know anatomy in order to do a good physical exam. So we have a very heavy emphasis on anatomy. And our students are lucky enough to uh, dissect their own cadavers. We have about five to seven students per cadaver. Uh, so we are very fortunate in that regard. We also have a principles of interviewing course, which is where all of our students learn how to take a complete and accurate health history. This happens directly in the Sim Center. Every week, our students are practicing their interviewing skills in the Sim Center. This is a small group course where our students work in groups of six to eight with one faculty instructor. And it's basically just a discussion course. There is absolutely really no teaching that is goes on here. This is not lecture at all. It is a seminar course. And each week we have role plays where our students practice their physical exam skill, or I'm sorry, their interviewing medical history skills based off of the topic of the week. Now that may be bias in medicine or bias in medical history. That may be the difficult patient or the patient who answers yes to everything. So we have lots of different scenarios we put our students through in this very first semester. Professional issues for PAs. This is the first course of a seminar or a series of courses that happens throughout the didactic phase. Uh, this is where students are gonna learn the history of the PA profession. Um, I like to say that I think most of our students know the history of the PA profession before they get here, but that's absolutely not the case. Our students learn so much in this course about um, how to get licensed and what organizations oversee licensure and PA practice especially in the state of Ohio. Diagnostic methods is the uh, another course in the uh, summer semester. This is a course that is going to teach our students everything you need to know about ordering and interpreting labs and diagnostic studies. So this stems all the way from labs to radiology to EKG. All three of those are taught throughout this entire course. Um, and uh, it's kind of taught in modules. So there's the lab piece, there's radiology piece, and then there's EKG, which is kind of taught in a, uh, in a boot, camp, boot camp format where our students go to EKG every day for a week or two at the end of the semester and learn all there is to know about EKG. And then finally, clinical correlations. Clinical correlations was a course that was developed in order to um, help students understand the importance of anatomy. Uh, it's very easy for students to kind of just look at anatomy and say, oh my gosh, I got to know the brachial plexus. But then in clinical correlations, we go through cases that are helping you understand why you need to know the brachial plexus or why you need to know the spinal anatomy. Well, you need to know the spinal anatomy because if you go to do a lumbar puncture in a patient who has meningitis and you don't know the anatomy of the spine, you're going to do some damage. And so we do some clinical correlations cases where our students are understanding the very importance of anatomy. And it's funny, I was with the students today and we were talking, the students who were just in anatomy, you know, they finished a month and a half ago. And at the time, you know, you're in anatomy, it's like, oh, anatomy, it's terrible, it's hard. And then today, you know, they say it's so incredible how important anatomy is when it comes to making an accurate diagnosis and doing accurate physical exams. The interesting thing about our curriculum is it is, um, we have repetition throughout our entire curriculum. So for instance, in summer semester one, you're gonna learn EKG, but that's absolutely not the last time you're gonna see EKG. You're gonna see EKG many, many times throughout the rest of the didactic curriculum and into your clinical year. So really we're introducing EKG here in the summer. 
but uh, we really dive deep when we get into cardiology or emergency medicine or ACLS, advanced cardiac life support. So you're going to see EKG here, but that's not the only time you're going to see it. And that's where a lot of these things are. You're going to see anatomy here. This is the anatomy course. But guess what? When we're learning renal disease processes, you're going to be learning the anatomy of the kidney again. And hopefully at that point, it's just review. Fall semester, this is where we really get into the meat of medicine. Uh, we are really diving deep into disease process causes, diagnostic studies, treatments, okay? So we have uh, courses here that all really flow very nicely together. So human physiology, this is taught completely by PA program faculty. It is a course that teaches our students the medical physiology needed to practice as a PA upon graduation. If you understand the normal physiology, it's very easy then to identify abnormal physiology or what that's called known as pathophysiology. And then if you stop and think about pathophysiology, it's much easier to understand disease process and even treatment. So our human physiology is taught, it's taught uh, once a week, it is taught in blocks. So you're gonna, you're, you're gonna learn cardio phys and you're gonna learn palm phys or whatever order that comes. Every four weeks, we do a very large case study, a four hour case study where our students work in groups of six to eight and they get big discussion case studies based off of physiology. So basically, you know, you may see a question that says, um, diagram the renin angiotensin aldosterone system and discuss why hypertension can be caused by decreased blood flow to the kidney. You know, you name it, our case studies really dive into the physiology and pathophysiology. Professor Krauss, who's our director of didactic curriculum at this point, her and I actually go around to all the groups when they're doing these discussions and do a lot of teaching and these four hour case studies. So those happen three times a semester in that course. Physical diagnosis, this is learning the technique to actually put your hands on patients and make accurate diagnoses, okay? Um, we are very passionate about the physical exam that we teach our students. Uh, I am a stickler when it comes to physical diagnosis. I am very, very passionate about doing a good physical exam. And I never want our students to just run out and order all these tests that they can because they didn't spend the time to actually try to make a diagnosis doing a physical exam. So our students learn a head-to-toe physical exam and physical diagnosis. Uh, we use the simulation center to practice our physical diagnosis skills. Again, we do that on a weekly basis. Then we've got microbiology and infectious disease. This is where you're learning all of the infections. So you're learning the infections of the dermatologic system of the pulmonary system, of the cardio system, uh, and you get the picture here. So this is going to be disease process, pathophysiology, cause, microbiology. So what does Staph aureus look like under the microscope? And then how do we treat it? So lots of antimicrobials. Pharmacology one. So this is learning all about the drugs we can use. So this is gonna learn pharmacokinetics um, and uh, mechanisms of actions, indications, contraindications, interactions, et cetera. That's actually taught by a, pharma, a, a farm D um, from university hospitals. He comes over and teaches our students pharmacology. He's a fantastic instructor. Going back to infectious disease, that's actually taught by an infectious disease PA and an infectious disease physician. They split that course. They come basically every other week and teach it. And then finally, principles of internal medicine. This is a seven credit course that occurs in the fall semester. Uh, this is in body systems. So you're going to, like I said, learn dermatology, cardiology, pulmonology, et cetera. I would say 70% of this course is taught by adjunct instructors that are experts in their field. So we've got a cardiology PA who teaches our cardiology curriculum. We've got a pulmonolo two pulmonology PAs who teach our pulmonology curriculum. Um, rheumatology PA who teaches our rheumatology. So 
you get the picture here. We bring in experts in their fields in order to teach our students the disease process, et cetera. And then this is where we kick off our preclinical clerkships. It's also where our students do their experiential learning and their community service. Uh, so every Wednesday and Friday morning are blocked off on our students' schedules for other obligations, such as preclinical clerkships and experiential learning. So a little bit more about our fall semester, it is in blocks. And so, um, and this is kind of a tentative schedule. This can fluctuate on an annual basis, but this year block one was dermatology, endocrinology, and neurology. And basically the way our blocks work, every Monday we will kick off a new block with physiology. So basically you're gonna learn physiology of the endocrine system before you start learning the endocrine disease process. In the middle of learning endocrine disease process, you're also going to be learning the medications in pharmacology, the endocrine system. Okay, so there is a little bit of overlap. So dermatology doesn't happen just in one week. That may comprise over three weeks. Endocrinology may be three weeks as well, but maybe dermatology is the first three weeks and endocrinology is weeks two, three, four. So there is a little bit of overlap but um, we are in blocks. And so what happens is our students will go through four weeks of class and then have a week of exams where they're gonna have exams over dermatology, endocrinology, and neurology. And basically what that is, it's gonna be physical diagnosis, pharmacology, and then disease process. Okay, so internal medicine. Second block is cardiology, pulmonology, and renal. And then the third block is GI, rheumatology, and hematology, oncology. Um, Block scheduling and system scheduling is just very, very good for learning and retention. Um, and so um, we're very, very um, passionate about how we teach our students. They learn normal, then abnormal, and then treatment. And that's basically how it, it goes. Spring semester. Spring semester. Now we're taking a really big deep dive into medicine. So our spring semester... Ethics and healthcare delivery. This is taught by our bioethics department here at Case Western Reserve University. It's a discussion-based course based off of all the ethics that you're going to run into as a practicing provider. Professional issues for PAs too. This is, a, again, the second course in the series, like we talked. This is a course where our students practice wellness and resilience. They are learning wellness and resilience themselves so that they can teach their patients wellness and resilience and how to use exercise for medicine, et cetera. They do a personal learning plan where they'll actually think of something that they want to change. Be it, I want to drink less coffee or I want to get more than two hours of sleep a night or you, know, you name it, our students are going to work on it and they're actually going to do a little bit of data-driven research on ways to improve that aspect so that they can then deliver that to their patients. Pharmacology too, this is just a... Um, Continuation of Pharmacology 1. If you notice, if you're paying very, very close attention, as I'm sure this is an exhilarating webinar, Pharmacology 1 is two credits. Pharmacology 2 is three credits. Why is Pharmacology 2 three credits? So this is where our problem-based learning curriculum lives. Our problem-based learning curriculum is one credit. It, it lives within pharmacology. And we've got it really spun around pharmacologic mechanism. So our students will do a case and every week there's going to have to be a treatment decision they're going to have to make based off of pharmacotherapeutics and interactions, et cetera, et cetera. And that's where our problem-based learning curriculum comes. Surgery and emergency medicine, it's a standalone course where you're learning all of the surgery and emergency medicine that you're going to encounter as a PA. Uh, so that's going to be cardiac emergencies, lung emergencies, GI emergencies, upper GI bleeds, lower GI bleeds. Uh, we also do a little bit of critical care medicine in this course where our students are learning about IVs. How do you how do you order fluids in the intensive care unit? How do you manage a patient who's bleeding in the intensive care unit? How do you work a ventilator? How do you order? Well, how do you change the PEEP and the pressure settings, et cetera? Very, very practical medicine so that when you graduate, you're ready to hit the ground running on day one. OBGYN, so this is going to be our women's health curriculum. Uh, so we learn OB, so pregnancy, delivery, abnormal pregnancy, and then gynecology. 
Um, again, this is taught by adjunct instructors who are experts in OBGYN, lots of OBGYN physicians and uh, PAs and NPs. This is where our birthing simulation lives as well. Behavioral medicine. So behavioral medicine, there are there is one simulation of behavioral medicine where students deliver bad news to a patient. They have to go, they have to learn how to give bad news and then they go in and actually tell a patient bad news. Uh, behavioral medicine, very unique course. This is 100% flipped classroom. There's absolutely no lecture whatsoever. Our students get the recorded materials uh, prior to class. They get them week, a week prior to class. They come to class having prepared that or having been prepared. They take a five question quiz at the beginning of class just so that they actually did watch the recordings or listen to the slides. Uh, these are very, very easy five question quizzes. If you watch the slides and the slides are anywhere from 30 to 50 minutes in length, if you watch them, you're going to get a five out of five, no questions asked. Those that don't watch them, have, they can struggle on the five question quizzes. But then all we do is discuss. So for instance, if the week is anxiety disorders, they'll listen to the anxiety disorder lecture. And then they'll come to class and we'll discuss cases of anxiety disorders. Um, and students will work in pairs to answer questions. And then you get in and it's like a debate course where our students will say, well, I think it's A because of this. And another group will say, well, I think it's B because of this. And it really gives you an insight into how people are thinking. And a lot of the questions have no right or wrong answers, but it really opens the door for significant discussion. And then finally, preclinical clerkships two. This is just a continuation of our preclinical clerkships one. Again, in the fall semester, we don't really start that until October, November. We do our experiential learning and community service, which lives in this course as well. But uh, spring semester, everyone is going to preclinical clerkship from the beginning, and it, it spans the entire duration of the semester. The other thing that I forgot to mention, I briefly mentioned it, but the other thing that lives in this course is the interprofessional learning curriculum or interprofessional education taught by the Office of Interprofessional Education. Um, it's called Collaborative Practice One, where our students, again, work in, in groups. That is part of this course as well. They work in groups with med students, nursing students, dental students, et cetera. And finally, summer semester two, this is what we call the getting ready to go to clinicals. This is where we are buttoning things up. You're learning the procedures. You're learning how to suture. You're learning how to put chest tubes in, how to do lumbar punctures. You're learning all the things that you want to use in your toolbox for when you go to clinical rotations. Professional issues three. This is where you're learning how to bill. This is where you're learning uh, billing and coding and all of the business of medicine, okay? System of medicine. Culture and health. So we... Um, take a pretty deep dive into social determinants of health throughout our entire didactic curriculum. But in this course, it is really centered around the social determinants of health where our students work in groups on various aspects of the social determinants of health. And um, it's really a seminar discussion-based course, okay? Uh, we just implemented this year what's called a lunch and learn, se a lunch and learn sessions where our students will come on a voluntary basis, one Monday a month, where we'll provide lunch and there'll be discussion based off of each of the um, barriers to access to care, including social determinants of health. Um, so we're really excited and um, fortunate to be able to, to provide that to our students. And that's taught by uh, core faculty, but also experts in their field in the social determinants of health. Public health, learning all about public health and public health standards and vaccinations and pandemics and, and things like that. That's taught completely by our public health department. Uh, Professor Andrew Morris is just an unbelievable human being and he does great work for us. And that course is taught. Um, it is completely taught by the public health department, but they have tons and tons of guest lectures coming in uh, from the public health world. And then evidence-based evidence -based medicine, diving into um, evaluating statistics and understanding when you really want to use this medication. If this study said to use this medication, but you think to the contrary, how do you use evidence-based medicine to make your decision? We also have an elective. We are very, very lucky to be able to offer our students one elective 
Our students are able to take medical Spanish or research methods. At this point in time, we're always looking to expand our electives. Um, we've had requests for some electives. It's not like you can just snap your finger and things happen overnight, but we do have things brewing where we hope to be able to offer different electives in addition to these two in the future. Medical Spanish, this is taught by the Spanish department, research methods where you're gonna build a research proposal and work through writing a paper and start getting an IRB. We're really getting ready for summer semester two. At the end of summer semester two, our students do an OSCE where they're gonna do a skills examination. They're gonna actually see a patient and it's gonna be observed by a faculty and we're gonna be ready, we're gonna be sure they're ready to go to clinical rotations based off of their history, physical and decision-making skills. All right, I just flew through a ton, a ton, a ton of information about our didactic year curriculum. I see we've got some questions rolling in. Uh, I just wanna give you a little bit of an update on our application timeline. Um, this is today's webinar. We do have a few more coming up in a couple of weeks. Uh, our final application deadline is November 1st of this year. We are in the process of interviewing. We've had two interview days already. We plan five more between now and December. Uh, four or five more. And then um, after interviews, students are going to be uh, notified of their admission and enrollment. Orientation and classes will begin May 2023, and the summer semester officially launches May 22 of 2023, but orientation begins May 15th. Uh, so we're, uh, we're rocking and rolling here on our application timeline. All righty, I'm going to kick it back to Sam. Sam is going to ask me some questions from you all. Um, if you have not been able to ask a question and you do want to, remember to use the Q&A bucket as the best way to go about that. Sam, what questions do we have today? Yeah, we have a lot. So the first one is about the Cadaver Lab. Yes. And it's, what access do students have to the Cadaver Lab outside of class time? What does that look like? Yes, the students have 100% access to the cadaver lab outside of class time while they're enrolled in anatomy. Um, that is, um, uh, they have key card access. They can go in at all hours to really study in the anatomy um, cadaver lab. Once anatomy is over the medical, so we're, we're fortunate that when our students are in anatomy, they're the only ones in anatomy. There's no one else here taking anatomy. And so that's why they have complete access. Once the medical students are here, um, which is after the end of the summer semester, the students don't have as ready access to the cadaver lab, but um, during anatomy, they have 24 seven access. Awesome, thank you. Uh, the next question the students want to know is, with students that have a lot of experience in the healthcare industry, is it helpful to have more than one type of experience working in healthcare? to help prepare them for di didactic year? Or is it better just to have one type of experience or does it not necessarily matter just what matters for them in terms of their personal growth? Yeah, it, it's really just what matters to you for your personal growth. I'll tell you personally, what was my experience before I went to PA school? I was a pharmacy technician and a nursing aide on the, on the um, general medical surgical floor. Um, that was, I, I was, I'm not, I wasn't a planner back in the day. I was not the most organized person. I just happened to think those were great. I didn't know how those were going to prepare me for PA school. I will tell you that pharmacy tech did prepare me quite a bit for pharmacology, not because I understood any of the pharmacology, but it basically because I could, I could recognize names of medication. Second of all, nursing aid really helped me in the sense that I could learn to talk to patients. I could understand disease process a little bit. But it's really all about personal growth. Um, I will tell you that the more exposure you get to multiple ways things go, the better off you're going to be from a didactic and clinical perspective. I am not by any means telling you that we look at students differently who have varied experience. That is truly not the case. We, we do a holistic admissions process, but I do think that you know, having varied experiences is important so that you can see all aspects of medicine. 
Awesome. Thank you. And speaking of the varied experience in medicine, a lot of students are interested because they are non-traditional and they want to know more about the experience portion of when they're coming back in the school and uh, is it an easy transition? Are there things to help prep them to get back into that didactic year? Because it is different going straight from working full-time to yeah. being a student full-time. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I will tell you that um, we value our non-traditional students. We uh, think they bring a, a lot to our program in the sense of diversity of life experience, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I will say that transitioning back into the didactic phase can be tough for students. We have um, resources in place where we really are hoping to get our students start off on the right foot. Um, so recently we've implemented sort of a pre-matriculation curriculum where our students get access to anatomy, physiology, microbiology, biochem, time management, and test-taking skills. It's a curriculum that we deliver to our students asynchronously that takes them, I don't know, 20 to 40 hours to complete and basically, we've done that in order to make sure all of our students are coming in on the same, you know, baseline knowledge of anatomy and physiology before they start the program. And we found incredible, incredible success in doing that. Um, the biggest piece of advice I have for students who are non-traditional prior to coming back to school, <clears throat> it's um, you've got to have all of your ducks in a row. What do I mean by that? You've got to be sure that you're financially stable that you're mentally and physically stable or healthy, you know, financially healthy, mentally healthy, physically healthy, academically healthy. There's there's lots of pieces to health that we look for in our students before they restart, before they start with us. And realizing that, you know, prior to PA school, if you were working full time, you know, you've got other obligations, obviously, but you leave the office or you leave whatever you're doing, you come home and you can tend to the you know, you name it, whatever you need to do, other obligations. In PA school, you have class and then you got to go study. And so understanding that is is really the biggest piece of advice that I have because um, it's not like you can just come to class and, and really succeed. Being a PA requires a lot of self-directed learning and the want and desire to have lifelong learning. Um, and so we really instill that in our students from the time they get here. Awesome. Thank you. When it comes to collaboration opportunities between PA students and between other healthcare students, what opportunities are there in the curriculum for that collaboration space? Yeah, um, there are endless opportunities. Like I said, our students every Wednesday afternoon, beginning in the fall semester, all the way through the spring semester. So about six, uh, about 30 weeks um, give or take, of curriculum designed specifically for collaboration with medical, dental, um, nursing, and social work students, where we have two hours of time blocked out for our students to work on projects with the interprofessional team and the interprofessional education team. That being said, uh, outside of those two hours, we have many things that we do. We do simulations with the nursing students. We do simulations with our um, midwifery program. Um, and so uh, we have students working in what's called interprofessional scholars collaboration in teaching and learning, which is an application to do educational research. So where you work with medical students and physicians or PAs on educational research, it's over a two semester period. So um, you know, that's one thing about, um, you know, interprofessional education and collaboration that is, that is defined as working interprofessionally. If you stop right there and say, okay, that's the definition, um, that could really mean just sitting in a class for two hours once, and that counts as interprofessional education. Well, that's not how we view it here at Case. We really push our students um, require our students to work on a on a weekly basis. Awesome, thank you. 
uh, the next question is about a day or a week in the life as a PA student during the didactic year. What does that look like for them? Yeah, I love that question. So our students, um, you know, those that come directly from undergrad, they look at their undergrad curriculum and they have organic chemistry that happens Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. or 8 a.m. to 8.50 a.m and lab on Thursday afternoon from one to four or, or whatever it is. Here at Case, we have kind of not a floating schedule, but really a floating schedule. And the reason that is, is because we want to bring in the experts in the field. And so because of that, we don't have like Monday, Wednesday, Friday class from eight to nine and then 9.30 to 10.30. Um, basically what happens is um, some of the classes are stagnant. So like every Monday morning in the fall semester, we have interview um physical diagnosis every monday morning in the summer one semester we have interviewing and so basically we have we tell our students that they should be they should expect to be in class anywhere from 8 to 3 30 or 8 to 5 every day uh, monday through friday um lots of fridays we get out you know we try to get out by noon or you know three at the latest on friday sometimes we go a little later just due to guest instructor availability um we build in a one hour lunch every day so our, there's no class between 12 and 1 every single day um and there's half hour breaks between each course so there's if there's a two hour class then you have a half hour break before the next one so i would say that in the life of a pa student at case you're in class you know, eight to noon, you do whatever you want over your lunch. You may go for a run or a walk or, you know, whatever, or just eat. Um, then you're in class from one to five and then five o'clock, you may go home, you know, hang out with friends for a bit and then hit the books for, you know, five hours that, you know, four to five hours that evening. Uh, all depends on what's coming up, what, how close we are to exam week. Um, so eight to five really uh, is what we expect. Um, you know, sometimes we'll go a little later just because of guest instructor availability, but sometimes there'll be, you know, just for instance, this Thursday, our students are done by noon. They don't have class afternoon. Um, and so uh, it really all depends on that week. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, the next question is about, is the courses all cohort based or are there some that are not cohort cohort based? I don't know that I understand what that question means. I, I think oh. from my understanding is that they want to know if every single PA student is all in the exact same classes yeah. together or are they split at any time? Nope. So they're all in the exact same classes. So we are a lockstep program. So summer one only happens every summer. Fall only happens every fall. There will be some courses where you're in a small group. So like uh, history interviewing course, you're in a class with the same six to seven people every week. You're taking it alongside other groups of six to seven, but it is completely lockstep. So our students are all in interviewing together, all in anatomy together, et cetera, et cetera. Um, some of the courses may have small group seminars, but um, everyone is taking the exact same courses at the exact same time being ass assessed the exact same way. Awesome, thank you. Uh, the next question is, are there any courses that are online? There are not any courses online. There are not any courses online. There, there is the occasional person who comes down with COVID, and we have to do a, a Zoom lecture. But uh, everything is, we are ninety nine point nine 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 percent in person. Awesome, thank you. And then this one, I think you're going to enjoy. So, what is your favorite part about the didactic curriculum? My favorite part about the didactic curriculum, you know, I think there's two things. I think that. Um, number one, the way our block system is set up, I just think it's a really powerful way to learn medicine. The other thing is the, the various ways we teach our students. I mean, there's really every single day is different. And every single instructor teaches in a totally different fashion, and it just keeps students on their toes. Um, I, I like to think I'm an incredibly engaging instructor and um, I think that all of our instructors are engaging and they really challenge our students 
Um, one thing that I've really focused on recently is the integration of basic sciences into medicine. You know, we have to learn anatomy, we have to learn physiology, we have to learn pathophysiology, and that if you don't understand the importance of those, they're going to be very tough and dry to learn. But we really, really push students to understand why that's so important. And so integrating basic sciences has been a huge goal of mine, and, and we're well on our way of doing that very well. Awesome. Uh, speaking of block scheduling, you've mentioned that a few times, and some of the students are wondering if it's similar to undergrad, or is it a different formula of how all the classes are run? Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty much different. I mean, so basically what happens is when I say block scheduling, for four weeks, you're going to be taking courses. So for instance, the first block this year is neurology, endocrinology, and dermatology. For four weeks, the students are learning physiology of those systems, disease process of those systems, physical diagnosis of those systems, and treatment of those systems, all within that same block. And they, they really, they feed off of each other. So when you learn how a patient with diabetes is going to present when you're looking at them, what their physical exam is going to be, what their symptoms are going to be, what their history is going to be. And then the next day you're learning how you're going to treat someone with diabetes and pharmacology. But that Monday you learned the pathophysiology of diabetes because you were learning the physiology of the endocrine system. Um, so it's, it's really four weeks of class with no assessments and then a week of so basically our students are gonna take one exam, um, that week of exams over the pharmacology of endocrine, dermatology, and neurology, if that makes sense. I think that does, thank you. Um, and then this is the last one of all the pre-submitted questions about the didactic curriculum. There's a couple about the application process and I wanna save those towards the end. Yeah. Um, but the last one I have is what are the resources that students have access to during the didactic year? Yeah, uh, we are, it's so funny you ask because we are so resource rich that I had to actually sit down recently and map out exactly what our students have access to in the didactic phase. So first and foremost, we have an unbelievably robust library here, a virtual library where our students have access to nearly every textbook that we require they have access to case studies, they have access to test questions, et cetera, et cetera. So that comes just with Case Western Reserve University admission. Then you go into the program resources that we provide to our students. And so our students get access to various, uh, what we call board-like question banks where they can look at you know, thousands upon thousands of questions that are gonna look like the multiple choice questions are gonna see on their board exams or the exams that they're taking here in the program. We have um, resources called Aquifer, A-Q-U-I-F-E-R, which is basically self-directed um, case studies. We've got, um, we've got things like UWorld, we've got things like Real DX. So um, really you name it, we've got the resources that we purchased for our students. Um, it all starts with the library. The library is unbelievable and what are, what is is um, provided. And then we we take it a step further with our question banks and case study resources that we have that are built directly for PA students. Awesome. Thank you. And it doesn't look like there's any other questions that have been submitted about my didactic year, which hopefully that means that we've covered everything under under that realm. Um, some of the other questions that I've submitted more about the application process and those types of things are starting with patient care hours. Goodness knows direct patient care hours gets a lot of the questions. Um, but this one in particular is asking about if there's a preferred specialty or specialties that we look for in the application process. Nope, not at all. See, no preferred anything in the application process when it comes to when it comes to uh, uh, patient care experience. Awesome. And then in terms of any sort of those prerequisite credits, um, does it matter where they come from? Do they have to come from a four-year institution? Can they come from a two-year institution? What is the, your guys' stance on that? 
Yeah, it doesn't matter where they come from as long as they're coming from an uh, institution in the U.S. or Canada. That is really what we look for when it comes to our prerequisite courses. Awesome. Um, and then in terms of the clinical, uh, the clinical direct patient care hours that are needed, that um, that hour, or that number, not hour, um, is a thousand. Like, if a student just hits a thousand, is that good enough, or is it better to have more than a thousand? Yeah, you know, there's a minimum for a reason, right? We won't, we 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 will not, we cannot look at students who don't meet our minimum. But I will tell you, and I don't have a number off the top of my head, that the majority of students applying have well over the 1,000 hours and the majority of students applying have well over the 3.0 minimum GPA, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I think if I remember correctly, based on the stats, I think the majority of students have roughly around on average 3,500 3, hours, I think is the- Yeah, the you know, I, I wanna say off the top of my head, we're like 35, 3,600. And, and, and that, that number obviously changes and fluctuates every single day. Right, that's true. Um, let's see. In terms of students that are a reapplicant, what are some of the um, the th the advice that you would give someone that is looking to reapply to the program? So, advice to give to someone who's reapplying? Yes. Yeah. So, the biggest the biggest piece of advice that I give students who are reapplying to the program is have an outsider review your application and your interviewing skills. When I say an outsider, that doesn't mean your brother or your sister or your aunt or your uncle. I mean someone who maybe you've never even met before who's going to give you very critical analysis of what you are submitting. Very, It is very, very easy for me to look at what I'm submitting and think, that is amazing. How could no, how couldn't I get admitted? Or it's very easy for, you know, my wife to look at what I would submit and she would say, how would you not get admitted? You need someone to critically look at it and it's much easier for an outsider to do that. So that's my biggest, biggest piece of advice because it's very hard unless, you know, it's very hard for us to take a critical enough analysis of our own submission. And I'm saying us, as in if I'm applying, it's very easy for me to say, I don't understand why I didn't get admitted because you're, you're missing, you know, it's, you know, you, right. You know what you've done. Um, and so I, I just, I, I strongly suggest students have an outsider view of what they're submitting. Uh, I think that's the biggest thing. And the other thing is, I will tell you that if it were me and I didn't get accepted to any PA program or, or whatever that may be, in my personal statement, I would say, or, or somehow, some way, tell people what you've done since that last application cycle, um, or talk about flaws in your CV or gaps in your CV, or talk about grades that were not as good as you wanted them to be. Talk about those. Don't make excuses, but talk about them. It's much easier to talk about them than to try to hide behind them. That makes sense. It's bringing out that elephant in the room that Absolutely. we're already thinking about. Awesome. And then the last question about applications items is about the test score options. So right. is there a preference between the GRE or the PA CAT? Are they both looked at equally? Is there one that's better than the other? Yeah, there's no preference at all. We look at them 100% equally. Um, you know, we we, uh, we just wanted to expand our standardized testing um, options because there are some programs that are going just to the PA CAT and we didn't want to force our students to take PA CAT and GRE. So we gave students the option. Awesome. Thank you. And then the next question that I received is different, different um, vein, but similar to the resources question I asked earlier in terms of or in terms of resources that are outside of for curriculum and outside of the PA program at Case Western. Um, this student wants to know specifically about mental health, but I know there's other resources out there beyond that. Can you talk to more about those that students have access to? The mental health resources? Yeah, mental health resources or anything to do with like Title IX, LGBTQ, yeah. or just like student resources that are 
outside of class stuff. Absolutely, yes. So we um, we have a very robust um, resource availability here. We've got 24-7 mental health and counseling availability for our students. Uh, we work very, very closely with the University Counseling and Health, University Health and Counseling Services. We work very closely with a number of providers in the area that are primary care providers for our students. Um, we work very closely with the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. In fact, one of the um, um, members of the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion is within our office suite, so we work very closely with him. Um, and so we're very we're very proud of the resources that we can provide to our students. Uh, so each each of our students, when they get here, we go through all of the resources available, and then they're a but they're a button click away on on our learning management system where our students can go and find. Ooh, they told me I have access to this. How do I get there? Or how do I file uh, a mistreatment? Or you know, you name it. Uh, we have uh, one click access for all of our students to go and be able to find that quickly. Awesome. Thank you. And then the last question of the afternoon is what are some last pieces of wisdom that you would pass on to students that are looking to apply to the program or potentially have already interviewed things along those lines? What would you what would you say to those students? Yeah. Uh, so the first thing is, I think that no matter where you go to PA school, you're making an amazing decision. I think that far too often students in the application process try to be someone that they are not. Um, we are very, very educated and skilled in being able to determine that. Um, we've got um, years and years and years of experience here at Case, and I'll tell you that in many programs across the country, it's the same way. You need to be who you are. We are looking to accept the person that you're going to be for 27 months, not the person that you're able to be on paper and not the person you're able to be in a one-day interview session. Okay, so I need to take that and really, really think very, you know, in-depthly about that. We want to know exactly who you are, and that is what we're looking for in our interview day and our interview process. We are very, very laid back in our interview process. We are um, excited to get to know people on a, you know, on a personal level outside of their paper application. Um, and, but we also know that people are looking at us as well. We are interviewing students as much as they are interviewing us. And so, you know, we want to show people what we have to offer here at Case. We want to show people what we're going to do in the PA world, PA education world, and for the PA profession. Um, and so it's very important for us to be who we are. And interview day, we're not going to, I promise the people you see on interview day are going to be the exact same people who greet you at the door on May 15th of 2023 when you come here. Uh, and that's really what we are, and that's what we are here at Case. Um, so the biggest thing, critically analyze your stuff. Let someone else critically analyze your stuff. I think that's incredibly, incredibly important. Be who you are as a person. Don't put on a facade. Don't try to pull a wool over someone's eyes. Just be who you are as a person. And before you start school, I strongly suggest being sure that you are financially healthy, mentally healthy, physically healthy, have all your ducks in a row because PA school is hard for 27 months. It's very, very, very difficult. It's a finite period of time though. It's only 27 months. Okay. And I always joke with the students and I say, you know what? 27 months is going to stop. No matter what I do, I can't make time stop. 27 months is going to come and go. And you've got to make the best of it. You've got to come in with an open mind and understand everything that you're going to learn and really dive in deep. Um, but you can't do that unless you're ready, really, really, really ready, unless you're really, really, really ready. Um, and so uh, that's my biggest piece of advice and wisdom uh, for all of uh, all of our applicants and all of our aspiring PAs out there. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you for answering all the questions. Thank you for your time and putting this presentation together and walking us through what it looks like to be a didactic student at Case Western Reserve University. Um, for those that are still on the call or are watching the recording, if you have further questions, we might not have been able to get to all of them. I tried to get to as many questions as possible, but I know there's some that might not have been fully answered just because of how you have to type everything, all that kind of fun stuff. So email us at paprogram at case.edu and 
see you and we'll be able to answer anything else that we might have missed. Also, I want to remind everyone that our application deadline is November 1st, so you want to make sure that you submit all your materials by then, but of course, you have a month and a half before that happens, so ideally you want to submit that before that point, unless you are missing some sort of material or you're still working on things, but you can still apply with if you're missing two courses that are finishing up at the end of this semester, you can still apply without those credits on your transcript. So I do want to mention that as well. So usually those are something that students have questions on that are missing. Um, but other than that, thank you all so much for being here. Um, you will get a recording 24 hours after this session. So sometime tomorrow around four o'clock, you should expect one in your inbox. And we hope to see your application come through in the next month and a half. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest Everyone, of your day. Thanks, Sam. Have a great Thank day. You.